I just realized that uh, uh, the first, my first scam was in 1996. Uh, I was a young 40 years old at that time. <laughs> and uh, times has gone by. Well, I, I am pleased to report on work that has been carried out for the last two years uh, in Boston and Cambridge. Uh, we had a team uh, uh, at uh, UMass Boston and uh, Mboyo and Ravi Jagadison at Harvard, and we have managed to uh, give some answers to a problem that uh, Mboyo explained to me two years ago here at CARM. Um, uh, he gave a talk. So I will try to give you some idea how to connect what he talked about earlier with some more uh, explicit computation that we have been able to do. So you know that guy. So, so, yeah. so uh, Stephen Jackson uh, has been my collaborator for a long, long time, about since 2003, I guess, we've been working together. I've done uh, quite a bit together. And then uh, there is Ravi Jagadison, who certainly a young star in the world of mathematics, starting as an undergrad at Harvard and working with Mboyo. So, so basically, as I said earlier, we, we met in June 2014, and Mboyo gave a talk uh, at CALMS. And of course, everybody knew knows who Bill is. So he spoke on uh, elliptic vibration and F theory. So the first, uh, the first two words uh, were repeated today, and then after that, he added a few more things in there. That, you know. So my understanding at that time was he was relating swing theory to the geometry of elliptic vibration and representation theory of Lie groups. And um, somehow, I, I, I felt that perhaps there are things that we could do together. So when we went back to Boston, we, we met a few times at, at UMass, and he explained the problem to me. And the problem, as I see it, is very geometrical, uh, because I don't know any physics. So he tells me, well, this is beautiful, but this is what the physicists see, and this is what you should be able to see, and so forth. So what I, the report that I'm going to give you today is going to be from the point of view of someone who does, who does not understand physics, but has a clear idea of what the geometry should be. And, and that's basically what. And then Ravi is, as I said, an exceptionally talented undergrad, and we will be hearing quite a bit from him in the future. I'm quite sure of that. So, oh, this thing caught what I, <laughs> oh well. No, oh, that's not good. So, well. The talk that, so Mboyo spoke a bit about uh, this piece over here that you don't see. The only difference, <laughs> oh, oh, well, the, uh, the only difference, uh, this thing is out of, this thing is out of, all right, so, this is, the pay, this is the piece that we are interested in. That piece, as you can see, is certainly the equation is a cubic equation. And that piece, if you want to think about it, uh, think of it as a, as a scalar product or a dot product, and you take the absolute value. So therefore, you, lose, uh, you have some singularity because absolute values certainly uh, are not differentiable everywhere. So there are places where you would expect singularity. And Mboyo mentioned that in his earlier talk. And the, what, what we seek to understand is the nature of those singularities. So now, it turns out that uh, you know, those singularities are basically along hyperplanes, uh, because you can take off a vector, and a vector defines a hyperplane. And then those hyperplanes uh, have physical meaning. And I will explain that uh, uh, later on. So those are terms that I don't really need to get into for now. Maybe I'll come back. But Mboyo already 
define the problem. So what is it? Is that you have some Lie algebra and you have some representation of that Lie algebra. Those representations have weights. You look at, so there are two of the representations that we are interested in for, for, for the purpose of this talk. It will be what they call uh, the first fundamental and the second fundamental representation of the Lie algebra. In this case, to start with, we start with GLN, which is the set of all matrices, uh, that's it. Uh, but we do have results for the others, and maybe I'll mention that. And uh, so those are the two representations that we are working with. Uh, so, so the vectors are, so the weights are vectors, and then what, what happens is that, uh, is that uh, in, in certain cases, for example, M. Boyo again mentioned that work that he had done with Yao and some people at Harvard, they were able to understand that this algebra. They are able to understand uh, how many hyperplanes that you have in there, how many lines, uh, and so forth. Everything actually is going to go to the origin, so there is really one zero-dimensional uh, uh, phase, if you want. Uh, uh, so those papers are available, I think. So let me now give you some more. For example, for uh, SL3, the set of uh, matrices of trace zero. So M. Boyo and his team have found out that the version, of course, is set by mu1 and mu2. And uh, there is only one interior wall that's divided into two pieces. And that's what Mboyo called uh, the Wiggs branch root, but basically the blue line that you see here, that's the hyper. So you have two chambers. You have this chamber and that one, and they share uh, this face over here. Now, Everything is taking place inside of the so-called fundamental veil chambers. And the reason that happened is that there is something called the veil group that permute the, cham that permute the chambers. So therefore, if you stay in the fundamental one, in fact, if you need to move to another one, for example, you just multiply by an appropriate uh, element of the veil group. But that's, that's a little bit too technical. But what is important, at least I didn't know, uh, M. Boyo told me is that apparently for physicists, the, the, those, uh, those mu1 and mu2 are quite important because that's where the, the bosoms became massless. And then he explained it to me in very glorious terms, but I can't really remember that much about the discussion. Now, in dimension four, you see, so this is a picture that I believe that, uh, yeah, no, that's the next one. So in this case, you have three interior walls. So the interior walls are basically planes. And then you have four uh, uh, that's right, subchambers, uh, which intersect in the, in the line that you say L, that so therefore, that's a, so the incidence geometry is given, you know, what are the, the lines, what are the hyperplanes, and everything is given to you, and you can do all that. Now, what uh, the physicists, and uh, when they are working with uh, representation, basically write down the dimension of the representations. For example, um, this is the, so what I call the fundamental, the first fundamental, this is the second one, the exterior product. Those are the dimension. The dimension is uh, n and n choose two. So that's in the case of four, that's what you end up with. So you could do that, but however, once you move to n equal to five, then the situation becomes somewhat a little bit more complicated. But Mboyo and, and his team at Harvard were able to compute all those. Uh, uh, well, so there are nine interior walls in this case, and um, and you know all the planes and the equations of the planes and everything. So all that is done, 
And those, those are the kind of relationship between how do you get the lines, and then finally you have the zero space, which is always the origin. And all that was computed by his team. So again, Mboyo has managed, and in his team has managed to create a kind of graph that describes the relationship between uh, the chambers and their, and their relationship. So you say each circle is a subchamber, each has correspond to a, to a common interior wall between the two adjacent subchambers and, and so forth. It's the same idea, so you get the Higgs uh, field where the, the, the masses, as they, they, they go through those uh, walls, they become massless. So the question is that uh, you could try to write down everything that you have in terms of, so, so whenever you have something like that, as Emory said, how do you generalize something like this? Or was there, is there something, is there a structure that you, you can see the structure very clearly in dimension two, three, and four, and, and five? So the question is that, uh, can you generalize that? Well, for example, we know that N0, for example, in this polynomial that we have written, it's going to be always one because you always have the origin. It's the only zero-dimensional space. Uh, well, NR, you can think of it as the number of subchambers uh, partitioned by the interior walls. That will be the N minus R minus one. And then the interior walls, they are subdivided and so forth. So there you get smaller chambers as you go down. But what you would like to do is to be able to write a polynomial of that form. Now, so when, uh, when uh, Mboyo told me about this problem, I, I was kind of fascinated by it. First of all, uh, the, for, for people who have worked in representation theory, this is not quite a representation theory problem in the sense that the representation theory is there. <laughs> you, you know exactly what representations you are dealing with. And those are simple representations to the extent that they are minuscule since they are kind of, uh, so the, and they are well understood therefore. So the, 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 the problem that <laughs> I felt is that I told them, boy, well, this thing is known. So somewhere, somewhere someone should know how to do this. And the reason why I, I, I said that is because I know that there is a large group of uh, mathematicians um, who work on arrangements. And, you know, uh, teats, uh, all the work that were done with uh, uh, cells and chambers and, and you know, many people. Uh, in fact, I wrote to some of those people for about two weeks before I started wasting my time on this because I didn't believe that it was not known. But I, I was not getting the, an answer. And at some point, someone told me that, well, you know, uh, perhaps you should talk to Z Z Zaslavsky and, uh, because in the 1970s, he did work related to these sort of things. And in fact, he did, and I look at some of his papers. The problem with this is that uh, most of those people, they work over the whole space. They look at arrangement over the whole space. However, when you have your restrictions like we have for the veil chamber, like the veil chambers, then it's not quite, you, 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 could, you, could, you could restrict the theory in order to do the counting appropriately. So that becomes a little harder to do. That's one thing. And also the second thing is that the theory that Zazraskis have developed and many people have followed, the, that theory gives you very nice theorems, but you can't, you can't really compute with it because they use some, um, what they call a Mobius function. And the Mobius function somehow is the kind of functions that are looking at subsets and trying to compute uh, numbers related to the number of, it's, it's a mess if you try to work with it. I mean, on small, on small dimension that you could do something, but once you go further, you can't, you can't do that much with it. Um, so now I will explain to you what we have done. Uh, 
So the idea that I have when I started this is that I spoke to Mboyo, and I, so we are writing letters to each other, even if we are living in the same city, or less that we are writing letters to each other. So what I said was that if we could find a way to know the, the number of interior walls, those are slices that you have, then you can somehow have a size of the problem, and then once you are given that, the size of that problem, then you can try to see if you can develop a theory by which uh, you, you have functions in terms of the, uh, the number of interior walls. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you look at Zelevin's, uh, Zaslavsky's work, one of the things that was nice is that you could relate this problem to matroid theory. And once you are looking at that matroid, then there are ways of uh, associating uh, what they call a chromatic uh, polynomial to the graph that chromatic polynomial somehow will give you coefficients that will count the number of uh, space of dimension two, three, four, five, n until you get to the end. Again, the problem is that uh, it's very hard to do that uh, uh, with uh, what Zaslavsky has done in his thesis. But, you, you, but so we are able to compute the number of interior walls and there is, a, you know, it's, it's not difficult but all that is taking place inside of uh, SLN, that is the set of matrices of trace zero. Now, for those of you that are in the known, in the know, the way you know it was done really is by uh, look at the dual vel chamber and parameterize the weights in the way and then work out because, in some sense, the, in the specific case, the weight of the uh, of the fundamental. Uh, representations are fairly simple. And then, therefore, you can do some uh, algebra and you can count this. So, so basically, <laughs> in the polynomial that I had uh, shown you earlier, um, there is a slight discrepancy. The highest, the highest uh, power, the coefficients of the highest power, n, is actually of a different nature of that of the others. In some sense, the highest power is a face of the highest dimension. The others are flats that are intersections of hyperplanes. And so therefore, one has to be very careful the way you, you do your counting. So therefore, what we have done in this work is that we have two uh, different counting. One count the number of faces of different dimensions, and the other count the number of flats or cells of different dimensions. Now, I, I am reminded of, uh, of this. so when I was writing this, I, uh, I said a simple but fake and powerful idea. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, I, I was thinking of, a, of the Sisyphus Mate. That's, that's a book written by Albert Camus, in which, <laughs> I don't know if you know about the Sisyphus Mate, it's a guy you go up, down, you, you know, you got a big, uh, a big walk over your back, you go all the way up, you put it back, and you go, and then you go down again. You go the same thing. So it's like ever ending work. It turns out that uh, Albert Camus, in, his, uh, in, that, in this uh, essay, basically think about what's, what's the importance of a simple but fecund idea, which means that the idea itself is so simple that you, would, you, you, you keep on being surprised, but all it's given to you, and you will see that. The idea behind this is extremely simple, so simple that uh, I did not believe it at the beginning, and uh, in fact, uh, there was some convincing to be done, but, it, but it, it turned out to be the correct one. So, what we are going to do, although Mboyo's earlier problem was for SLN, 
So what we are going to do is to embed it inside of GL and we see the set of all invertible matrices. Well, from the point of view of uh, representation, so you can look at the Lie algebra of, G, of big GLN is called little GLN, which is the set of all matrices. And this is where things like Vell groups and all the things that we're talking about are certainly are well defined. So the second part was that Emboyo told me that uh, we, don't, we not only want to just compute, but also we want to just a generating function. That too I didn't believe. <laughs> I, I, I could believe that you can have some kind of recurrence relation that tells you how to compute some, some of those things. But I didn't believe that you could actually write down a generating polynomial. And apparently, Mboyo cheated. He had other reasons to believe it from, from the point of view of algebraic geometry. Uh, that, that should be the case. And in fact, it turned out to be the case, but we didn't know that. So what I will explain in full detail is what we have done for GLN. And then I will say a few things about SLN. Um, GLN, which is the set of all matrices, and SLN is the set of matrices of uh, determinant one, or in the case of the algebra, is the set of matrices of trace zero. Although when you look at the set of all matrices of trace zero sitting inside of set of of all matrices, you just see there is a hyperplane there. It turns out that makes quite a bit of difference. <laughs> and in fact, you could have a theory because the geometry on GLN is really like kind of a cubic geometry. You know, it's like, it's like sitting in a cube. But on GLN, it's like a slanted thing. So, so therefore, it's not necessarily true that a nice theory on GLN descends in a very nice way on SLN. In fact, most of the time, that's not the case. Uh, so, in this case, the, the so-called fundamental vanilla chambers, as far as we are concerned, for us are going to be uh, diagonal matrices, and their diagonals will be of a certain type. Uh, for example, X1, X2, they, they all lined out this way. You can order them that way. They are all different from each other. And uh, the walls if, will be hyperplanes of that form. And then open chambers, because if you have hyperplane that's cutting, so you have open space, and that's basically what a chamber, open chamber would mean. And then you close it out, then therefore you get, uh, you get a, what we call a chamber. So the fa face is either a subchamber, which is a chamber of the highest dimension, that's what we call a face, or the intersection of a subchamber with a supporting hyperplane. So, 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 so you have a convex thing if you want, and then it sits, there is, there is a boundary on that hyperplane. So that's what I mean by supporting hyperplane. So that's how you get your face. And uh, in the case of GLN, the geometry is completely simplicial. So you are dealing with a bunch of cones. You know, that's, that's what's going on. So a flat, as I said earlier, is just an intersection of hyperplanes. And of course, everything has to be inside of the Vell chamber. So therefore, you have to, to take it like that. Now, this part here is important, KOM is that what we call a flat, these intersections of, uh, are basically the union of the faces that it contains. That's extremely important, and that's what makes the combinatorics work very well. So if you can find all the faces, and then you can find a relationship between the faces to define a, uh, a flat, then you have the flats. So that's the, the key step here. So let me give you an example. In the case of GL2, Now, the Vell chamber will be on the size on the bottom. Eh? X1 is bigger than X2, so therefore it's the bottom. In this case, you have X1 equals to zero. Remember, you have Xi plus Xj, so when i is equal to j, so therefore that's X1 and X2, and then this is X1 plus X2. So 
Now, you have the intro, your words are those three. And then uh, you have four subchambers that we have over here. So the faces now, so therefore, you have the subchambers are the, the two dimensional faces, if you want. There are five half lines. All right? They're exactly uh, two, uh, uh, one two flat, which is the whole. W, and there is three one flat, those are the interior walls, those are the flat, and you get one zero flat, which is the origin. That's the basic idea. Now, that's, that's the picture, and that picture is basically exactly what happened in any dimension, except that uh, is, that's the picture that you see here is, you know, everything will be like a uh, cone, infinite cone like this. That means the, 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 the veil chamber is going to be sp split into those, uh, those subchambers and so forth. So, so since we are dealing with uh, so-called uh, simplicial geometry, uh, you would want to know how to determine the extreme rays, because in the, in the geometry of cones, then uh, if you determine that you have, everything is simplicial, that being generated something of dimension n has n rays that generate it, of dimension k has k rays. You would like to know how to, at least know how many rays that you have there, and then try to find a relationship between a face and the rays that, that, that define it and so forth. So it turns out that you could work out things to show that, in fact, the number of subchambers is indeed two to the n. You saw that you saw that in the picture in the different pictures, but at least you saw that in the dimension two you got four. The number of subchambers is four. You know, so the, so therefore, and the reason why we know that is because you can create a bijection between. Uh, between um, the number of two chambers and this uh, set sequences of plus one and minus one of dimension n. So therefore, you get exactly two to the n. Okay, so that's the first thing. So you know how many subchambers that you have. Now, what about the extreme rays? So what we are going to do is that we are going to say, well, if you give me a subchambers, I'm going to tell you exactly how to get the extreme rays. And this is how this is set up. So let's look at this case. So you got minus one, one, and minus one. This is a sequence. So you could, you could think about it as in this multi set here. You look at those kind of diagonal matrices. All right. For the first one, you don't have a choice uh, since you have to reorder things, so therefore you have to use your zeros over here. But you are over here now, so you have only, so the one will go, will stay in front because you want to reorder. The negative one will be in the back, and then therefore you have to have a zero over here. Same situation over here, where you don't, you just, since you are M3, then you have everything to just rearrange things. So this is a well-defined uh, procedure by which one can, so having done that, then you can prove that the MI, S1 to SN, actually the N such vectors that you have turn out to be the extreme vector of that specific chamber. For a specific chamber, that's how you get the, 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 the. So, for example, for the case that we had earlier, so the C1, uh, the chamber for C1 is actually given by those two, M1 and M2, and so forth, and we, which uh, I, I could go back, but I don't think I need to convince you that you pick up everything. 
you know, the chambers that we have earlier. And you can see that the one that share uh, uh, an edge, uh, you know, a ray together, you can see that in a situation like this. Uh, and here, for example, and other places. Okay. So, so let me go back. So the idea now is that in order to capture the geometry, we need to develop some kind of combinatorial object that we can use in order to, do, to count those things. So, and this is what I will explain now next. So, the, so, so therefore, the extreme rays are all of that form that we, we saw that. Now, what I'm going to do is to have a partial order on those rays. This partial order <laughs> is a very good tool to have. And, um, and in fact, uh, Zaslavsky has one also for, for the kind of work that he wants to do. So this is how we define the, the partial order. And then now, so here's the claim. We claim that a set of extreme waves lie in a common subchamber if and only if they form a chain in the poset. That means you can just follow your nose and you're going to get them that way. The extreme vectors of a face from a chain in the end, and any chain in the end comes from a face. The length of the, the chain is the number of extreme vectors, so therefore that gives you the dimension of the face, because or everything is simply sure that way. So, for the case that we, are, we, we, we work, right, so now keep in mind, so this is what you have. So, this is, so I, I put plus and minus in terms of plus one and minus one. I just did it once. So, you can take off minus for minus one and plus for plus one. So, this is the post set that you get for the case that I just uh, showed you. And you see really that in this case, each, so those are your five lines that we had earlier. All right, so, so everything works out extremely well. This is one, two, three, four subchambers because the subchambers have dimension two, so they have two, two rays in them and so forth. All right, so that's, that's, that's the key step. For example, now let's look at three. For GL3, same situation, you, 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 do the, you, organize, you organize the poset as it is. So you see you get uh, eight uh, subchambers. And you can count them. You know, those are dimension three. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So uh, there are nine extreme ways. Those are, you know. <coughs> the number of vertices, and so on, and there are 16 two-dimensional spaces, and, there, and then you have, uh, well, two-dimensional faces that I should put, and then you have the origin that is one. That's always the case. So, now, how, did you, how do you get this? Uh, so, so, G and K is the number of K faces, if you fix the dim dimension n. Right? So the way you prove this is that this case was very easy. <laughs> Actually, I think it was the only real easy one because after that, uh, M. Boyo has to fool me more than once to tell me that, no, there is a mistake there. Uh, that shouldn't be. But in any case, that one, you just have to define kind of three different type of faces. Uh, you can arise of dimension k or it is in the configuration of n, and then you come up with this generating formula. Now, you always want to check yourself. For example, you know that in this case, if you look at uh, the faces of dimension n, which, which are the subchambers, so they, this actually gives you 2n, which you already knew. So therefore, you can, you can, you can 
get the first polynomial count that way. Uh, you can work it out that way. And in this case, you get, now, oops, sorry. Uh, the numbers, the numbers here are going to be a little slight because I remember this is, I'm, I'm working on GLN here, not SLN. So the numbers are going to be slightly different from what I showed you earlier, but that's kind of a prelude for this. So you, you see, you start seeing a polynomial. And, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, now things are going to get a little bit uh, more involved. So, so with some efforts, I would say with the efforts of Mboyo, <laughs> you can actually get this. And, uh, so that gives you a complete uh, way of expressing and then uh, you can actually set things up so that at least for the first 10 dimension, you can write down the complete. Uh, uh, remember, this, this computing only the faces, not flats then. So only the faces here. So you can, you can compute all that in a very nice way. Now, for the faces, as I said, in theory, you just build the posets and then you work out exactly how many, how many, so you already knew um, how many subchambers you would have, and then everything you can see work out in every, so in some sense, you know dimension one, uh, dimension zero, which is the origin, so that's one. The number of subchambers, you can get them by other means, so you, this turned out to always to be, uh, a square, a, a n square a two to the n, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> in in between, for a while, it was every man for himself. <laughs> but we managed to kind of uh, work things out. So this is what you could go for. Those are done very quickly. So it's not, there is no time, uh, computing time is not really matter for now. It's very quickly done. Now, the flats. Now, remember, the theorem that we said that every flat is a union of the faces that it contains. So in order, to, if you want to do some combinatorics there, you need to, you need to define objects from the, the poset that somehow will tell you when you, are, you have a flat. So, so you have to, 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 to have a gadget that somehow is in correspondence with flat in some ways. And it turns out the gadgets that we have, this is so called uh, an ensemble. There was a big, well, there was a lot of discussion of the term ensemble uh, that was coined by Stephen Jackson. And, but he said, why don't you call it a set? You know? but, uh, at the end of the day, the term ensemble was accepted. And <coughs> now, so those are interval on the, on the post set, and they are defined this way. But Mboyo had uh, done some, so when we, do, <laughs> when we did this, Stephen and I, we, we are certainly looking at, at our post set going from way down. Mboyo did this magical thing where he just turned it 45 degrees. And then everything appears to be a lot better that way. <laughs> So you can see that in this case, the ensemble is extremely well defined. So for example, the interval, the interval uh, zero to two is exactly that one, right? And then uh, three, four is that one, and then five to infinity is that one. So, we have to, so, this, so this is what the ensembles look like. So, so this is a 10 ensemble in this case. That's the dimension. And uh, so the maximal chain in this case you can see is the, well, it's the longest chain that you can get starting from one of them. And that's actually tell you the dimension of the flat, the, the, the dimension of the maximal phase, the dimension of the flat. So, there is a bijection between decay ensembles and decay flats. Now, there is a story about that. 
I proved this thing in one dimension, uh, going in one dimension, and then I sent, I sent the, the, the paper to Amboil. And then I couldn't, I was trying to prove it in, it, in, the, in the reverse, I couldn't prove it. And I told Amboil that I, I can't prove this thing. And then Amboil at later showed me that I had, the, 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 uh, yeah, there was some slight mistake in my definition of ensemble. <laughs> So therefore, there was a good reason why it was not going the other way, but finally we managed to do that. And then now that's the number of K-flats that you have. It's a little bit more involved, as you probably realize, uh, but uh, for example, one of the problems that we have is that uh, the, the initial conditions uh, we, we took a few things from granted and Emboyo figured that out that we shouldn't and then was able to push it further down and then for n bigger than or equal to four and then work things out better that way. So, but in any case, that's the formula for the key flats. And then that's the generating function that comes with that. So now that's beautiful. That's, that's fairly nicely done. So, well, of course, it's, now, to be sure, uh, you have to do some hand cell lifting in order to give meaning to those things, of course, because um, the, you know, the ring that you are going to work on, you know, things like square root may not be well defined. So you have, you have to kind of sweat a little bit, but in fact, you get expressions that are nice. And for example, you can, you know, we did the same thing for this. So those are the number of flats. Right? That's mean a cell of dimension two, three, four, and two n. So there you go. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's better that way. So as you know, there is only one flat of the highest dimension, which is the Vell group and there is one flat of zero dimension, so therefore you get the first term is one, the last term is one, and in and between, uh, those were the numbers that we talked about earlier. Now, for, so everything that I, I've been doing was for GLN. As I explained for GLN, the geometry is very simple. Those, everything is simplicial. The faces are simplicial, so therefore you can build, so the post set makes perfect sense. But when you're dealing with SLN, it means that you have now the set of matrices with traces zero, right? That's mean you look at the diagonal, the diagonal must be zero. Therefore, you, you, can, you can say, all right, I have this simplicial thing, but you have these hyperplanes. And so a face that you have for GLN may not be a face in the same sense for SLN because there is a shadow on this, on this, on this. Uh, and that actually makes things more complicated. And uh, a lot of the work was done to figure out exactly how to work this one. Um, so up to dimension five actually, the geometry of SLN turned out to be simplicial. So everything that M. Boyo and his team have done uh, uh, at that point were dealing with simplicial geometry. That, uh, but starting at six, it turns out not to be the case. And here that's uh, the blue, the blue ones are the non-simplicial faces. But in this case, you can also get the generating function to compute uh, the, the faces. That's the power theory for it. Now, as you can see, things get really complicated uh, to the extent that. But you can always compute um, in a very simple way, so you get all those numbers there. Those are the number of faces for the SLN. The, for the flats, as I said now, the theory becomes uh, more involved because you have to define what kind, of, uh, what kind of faces you have, which one is one side or the other, which one is caught by the 
explain. But at the end of the day, you do manage to, to, uh, to get things like this. So that's the generating function for the flat of SLN, and, and they are given this way. So the coefficients uh, tell you what's going on, but it's always, so those are, it's always better to look at things like that, because here you can see clearly that uh, those, are, those, are the, those are the, this is for SLN, not GLN, and I keep that in mind. Mboyo and Ravi have reserved for E6 and E7. He mentioned E6 and E7. As those of you, those are so-called, again, minuscule uh, 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 representation. For the non-simply uh, Lisk group, you, you have this. Uh, I know by non-simply Lisk, I mean that the, the woods have different, uh, <coughs> different uh, size, that's all. So that is done. The only uh, case that we have to deal with is the case of the spin representation. Stephen has looked at it, uh, but we haven't really done too much with it. But Stephen did uh, take a look at it, I think, uh, about what? About two months ago? Yeah, about two months ago, but we haven't thought about it. That. So that's, uh, that's basically it. Uh, 